The following episode contains content of a graphic nature and coarse language. All opinions expressed are those solely rendered by the hosts of Serial Spirits. Listener discretion is advised. Happy Mother's Day to all the ladies on Staten Island who supported prosecutorial vindictiveness against an innocent person. Should I become a millionaire, it would be my nature to grant all of you with each an envelope full of seed as a token of my heartfelt forgiveness, year after year, rather than a bouquet of rosebuds which blossoms shortly and dies out. It is only a tiny rosebud, a flower of God's design. But I cannot unfold these petals with these clumsy hands of mine. The secret of unfolding flowers is not knowing to such as I. The flower only the Spirit of God opens in my hands would fade and die. society something you are listening to serial spirits the podcast the words you just heard were published in the staten island advance in may of 2011 a mother's day letter from an imprisoned man named andre rand rand accused of murder but convicted of kidnapping, is serving a life sentence in the New York prison in association with heinous crimes committed during the 1970s and 1980s in the Staten Island community. Rand's name became synonymous with a long-standing urban legend of the Hudson Valley, earning him the moniker, the Staten Island Boogeyman. This story and the previous narrative strike a nerve deep in my soul. This crime literally struck home. That is because one of my family members was allegedly a victim of Andre Rand. Was Rand really the folklorish fiend of the old story? Where and how did this legend originate? What were the crimes and the evidence that led this community to believe that Rand murdered five children in Staten Island? Welcome to another episode of Serial Spirits the Podcast. It's me, your host, Brendan Shea, and as always, the one, the only, the beautiful. Annie Weaves, what's up, Shay? What is going on? We have a story. And it started out looking into urban legends, correct? And we went down our usual wormhole of weirdness. And we found some crazy shit. Shit got weird super fast. So this legend of Cropsy was something that was brought to me by a couple of other listeners. We want to tie our legends and our stories, our myth, into these factual claims and hauntings. And so I started doing my research on Cropsy and Andre Rand and the murders that he was accused of. I did hours of research and late one night called Shay and started telling him about how all of this fit together. And your response to me was, that sounds familiar. It did sound very familiar because you were talking about one of the victims who we'll get into. But I remember... See, I was born in Staten Island. I grew up there for a little while before my family decided to make the trek to Ohio. And both of my parents were born on separate sides of Staten Island. And uh, my dad, who uh, worked as an electrician there, I remember he was coming home 
one night we were little kids and we lived in this uh two bedroom apartment it was two levels but in order actually it was three levels in order to get to the first level the first floor of the apartment you had to come up a set of stairs and i remember my dad coming home covered in like dirt and just looked like he was wore out for two weeks i'm pretty sure it was almost two weeks and uh why this stuck in my head when when weebs brought this to my attention was because they were talking about all the search parties that went out for this victim. My dad was actually part of the search parties because this was my third cousin they were looking for. And as I said, we will get into uh, who this this person was. But um, I remember it vividly because it, it's weird how things stick in your head, right? How, how like memories right. trigger certain things. And I remember because it was the first time I ever saw a tick. Like the little stupid blood sucking thing, Lyme that, disease you know, causing little yeah, you know, little bastard. Yeah, and I remember we were in the bathroom, and I think my mom was either brushing my hair after I got out of the tub or something. And I'm like seven years old, six, seven years old, and uh, I remember looking down at my dad's pants that were on the bathroom floor because he had changed and you know left the clothes there and i seen a tick crawling along his pant leg and i freaked out and i said mom what is that my mom of course was like oh my god and it was a tick and that was the first time i ever saw or heard of a tick so it's weird how that correlates with that memory but that was what my dad was doing my dad was on the search parties looking for his third cousin and uh it's just it's insane and not only that not only that, like we will get into the whole establishment of where in relation to where um, Andre Rand was living, where he worked and where uh, the body was found was a state hospital called Willowbrook, which I said we'll get into. And my aunt Gina, who is my mom's sister, actually worked there for two weeks. And my other aunt Margaret, who is my mom's older sister, too. She volunteered there taking care of some of the patients in this place. And uh, it's just, you know, it kind of comes close to home because it's a small world how all this stuff correlates with each other and with this story. So, I mean, I was kind of excited to get into it to find out exactly what we could find on, uh, you know, Andre Rand. I was completely, totally shocked when you start recounting these memories to me and then you talk to your dad and you talk to Gina and they're basically confirming a lot of the research that I did in regards to this story. And so, you know, well, the Staten Island community at that point was still fairly small and secluded. And so the fact that they all came together, which we'll talk about in a bit, to search for the missing children and the fact that everyone recalls these memories so vividly because it was such a terrifying and terrible time in the Staten Island community. These people really lived in fear. Anyone who had children lived in fear during this time in Staten Island. And you know what? I think that this, I don't know for a fact because I didn't ask my dad this, but I think this may have been a catalyst. This might have been the icing on the cake for my uh my mother to finally say, hey, we need to get out of here. You know, uh, like she had, you know, her one of her older sisters that she was close with. My mom was one of 11 kids. And uh, her one of her older sisters was already living at, in Ohio. And she had loved it. My mom had visited a bunch of times. And I think this may just been the final catalyst for her to be like, you know what, this is, this is a scary place to be. You know, we grew up here. Uh, and it's just time to take our kids elsewhere, somewhere new, somewhere fresh, somewhere safer. So I think that might, you know, I'm not 100% sure that that's what happened, but I think it might have been, you know, knowing my mother, it might have been a, a good catalyst for her to get the hell out of New York. Right. And it's, I think, eventually may have been the catalyst for a lot of changes. And we'll hear about some of them as we go through the the research that I did. But I can't say that I would blame her. You know, you're one of 12 kids. And to think of some of the things number one, number one of 12. But we've talked about this before about missing persons cases. Murder is is terrible to have one of your family members murdered would be absolutely I can't even imagine what it would be like. But to have one of your family members, one of your children, literally just disappear into thin air, and 40 years later, there is still no 
there's no resolution to the majority of what happened in relation to this crime. It's still just a lot of speculation, a lot of rumor, a lot of myth, and some pretty weird shit as we get into this wormhole of weirdness like we talked about before. And I don't want people to think hearing this that the ties that I have to well, the one of the victims, Jennifer Swiger is her name. She was 12 years old, but I, I didn't know her. Uh, I only, you know, I remember being a kid knowing that this was a relation to me, but I, I never knew her. I never met her. It was actually my dad's third cousin. So uh, yeah, I didn't know her, but, you know, my dad knew the family. Uh, I knew her grandfather, Uncle Louie, but I, you know, had never met Jennifer that I can recollect. But, you know, we, we'll get into who Jennifer was and a little bit about her, but... uh yeah, I, I don't want people to think that I'm using this as some kind of reason to boost the popularity of the show or this, you know, whatever. But it was it just, just really it was, strange. It was strange that it was a coincidence. And I mean, and like I said, I remember as a kid and it just all came back that, oh, yeah, I, I have ties to this story because of Jennifer Swigert. Well, so let's uh, let's let's get into this. Weebs. Let's let's see what we can we can unearth here. You with wanna, this story. You want to listen about the Staten Island Boogeyman? Yeah. The myth to the murder? The myth to the murder. All right. Staten Island Boogeyman. I think Holly Ann um, is probably somewhere in Willowbrook. I think she's still, you know, where the College of Staten Island is now. As time went on, the, we found out that there were more missing children from Staten Island and all sort of associated with Andre Rand. Uh, what happened was probably a, maybe a week or two into uh, the search, uh, we were discovering that more children were missing, actually working with the police very closely, and they were saying, well, he was a suspect in Holly Ann, you know, Andre Aaron was a suspect in Holly Ann, and he was a suspect in Tahis Jackson, and a suspect in uh, Hank Garifoya, and doing research, we found out that he actually lived in the apartment building that Alice Pereira was um, was living in, and that goes back into the 70s, so this was a, a pattern that we found, and again, we worked very closely with the police to get as much information as we can. And the, the public was really the people that were giving us the information. Um, you know, who, who knew where Holly was, who knew some of her friends, uh, who knew some of her family. But we worked very closely with her, uh, her aunt, who I still keep in touch with today. So after Jennifer was found and the police were there and uh, emergency services came and... Uh, after maybe an hour or two, they started taking us out slowly. I was in a police car, and I was coming out the front entrance of what's now the College of Staten Island. And next thing I know, someone banging on the window, Donna, Donna. And I rolled down the window, and it was Holly Ann's aunt, Patty. And she said to me, did they find Holly? Is she in there, too? Is Holly in there, too? And she was just so desperate. I felt so bad for her. And, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why we never give up. They just, they, they want to know. They, had, they have to have some kind of closure. It, it was just such a sad, sad experience. I think the goal of the Friends of Jennifer was to give the families closure. It cannot be an easy thing to go 20, 30 years and never know where that child is, at least to give it a proper burial, to have some kind of closure. You know, uh, Holly Ann has a brother who is a police officer. You know, it had to be very difficult for him uh, when we went to trial to relive that whole experience, her mother, her father, you know, and... We wish we could have spared them some of that. I think overall, knowing the circumstances of Andre Rand and how he preyed on children and how no child has been missing since he's been incarcerated, I mean, that tells a story in itself. So I don't think any of them are alive. I, I would like to find their remains and have them return to their family so there's, there is some closure. So to understand this story, we must revisit the myth, the legend that Staten Islanders called Cropsy. Cropsy was a name long known among the children of the area. Numerous legends theorize how the legend started. Some say Cropsy was a farmer, others say a park ranger, whose family died in a terrible fire on the island that was started by campers. 
Cropsey then stalked the woods, seeking revenge on campers in the heavily wooded area. Some say he wielded an axe, others claim he had a hook for a hand. They claimed he frequented the woods in an area called the Green Belt, a forested area that held three separate hospitals. The Seaview Hospital, the Farm Colony Tuberculosis Hospital, and the Willowbrook School, a mental institution. What everyone agreed on was that Cropsey sure as hell scared the Staten Island children and, for the most part, kept them from roaming the area of Greenbelt and the hospitals. The factual basis behind the legend began in 1947 when the Willowbrook State Hospital was formed. Willowbrook found its home in what once had been the Halloran General Hospital, a United States Army treatment facility. The building was designed for 4,000 patients, but by 1965 held 6,000 residents. At that time, it was the largest state-run institution for people with mental disabilities in the United States. The conditions were deplorable. On average, there was one care worker per 50 patients. Hepatitis A ran rampant. Dr. Saul Krugman, a medical researcher at NYU, began conducting experiments with hepatitis A on the children of Willowbrook. Children were given live virus in order to study the origins of the virus and possible vaccination. It was rumored that children of Willowbrook were fed the feces of other residents who had tested positive for hep A in order to continue experimentation. Vaccinologist Maurice Hilleman stated, quote, the studies were the most unethical medical experiments ever performed on children in the United States, end quote. By others, the procedures were deemed ethically dubious. So this was 100% solidified that this guy was doing this. This doctor was doing it because I know I had talked to my aunt and she said that there was rumors about there, but there's no proof like at the time, you know, it was rumored to be going on. I mean, did you find factual proof that this guy was actually doing this? They know for a fact that he was feeding these patients shit. I did not find factual. Of course, there's not going to be any written. If this actually happened, there's not going to be any written documentation of them feeding shit to kids. What is known about hepatitis A is that it is spread just by uh, unsanitary conditions. It's spread by food. It's spread by feces. And so if the conditions were as deplorable at Willowbrook as all the accounts say they were, it wouldn't have been unheard of that all these children could have contracted hepatitis A just out of those conditions. Well, let's stop for a second. And and it's important. And I just want everyone to listen, get close to your speakers and listen to what I'm going to say. We as a society think we thrive on being the perfect species and we are far from it. We go to school, we learn history, we learn what is deemed appropriate with the right history to learn. And there's a lot of times that history is washed. You see them classify letters where you see one or two words and the rest are blacked out. That's what our history is. And this part of history tries to be erased all the time. We've dealt with it at Madison Seminary in Madison, Ohio, where there is a certain period where you can't find what happened in this building. It's because deplorable conditions were going on. People were being mistreated. Willowbrook State Hospital was one of those places. Penhurst Asylum in Pennsylvania was another place. The conditions were absolutely deplorable. How these people were treated. And this was a hospital that was, you know, run for people with mental disabilities. And you can have one thing wrong with you and be in sound mind. And they would have put you away in this place. Now, you know, I'm not saying that every parent that had a child there you know, was just trying to get rid of their, their kid because that's not the case at all. They thought it was a institution for, of higher learning for these people to help them live with their disabilities, to take care of them because some of these parents physically, financially, and mentally couldn't do it. So they put them in a place that they thought was safe for their children, but it ended up being unsafe. One of the things that I know about my family is that they don't really lie about stuff. And when my aunt 
Gina worked there. She worked there for two weeks and she had enough. Like, and she had worked in the medical field her whole life and she had enough. She said just the practices that were going on there that she's seen, how these people were living was just, you know, she said the smell was just unbelievable. It was the smell of piss, shit, vomit, and industrial cleaner. I mean, that's just a horrible, a horrible way to look at you know, or to remember something. That's what you walk in and, and you remember that. And and Geraldo Rivera actually broke the story that made, you know, this place famous and eventually shut it down because uh, the conditions and, you know, that's, you know, we'll get into the next part here with, but like, it, it's just, that's one of the things he remembers is the smell. To this day, he remembers the smell. So in 1965, Senator Robert Kennedy toured the Willowbrook and was so disturbed by the conditions the patients were living in that he gave the school a series of recommendations, which eventually led to new federal laws being passed in regards to caring for the mentally ill in facilities. In 1972, a young news reporter from New York named Geraldo Rivera led an investigative report on the Willowbrook School, exposing the horrendous conditions the patients endured there. The downfall of Willowbrook had just begun. By 1986, the number of residents had dropped to 250, and in September of 1987, the doors of Willowbrook closed forever. However, it did not mean the residents of Willowbrook were gone for good. The sprawling facility was almost as large underground as it was above ground, Underneath the hospital was a maze of tunnels that had allowed former employees access to each department. When the facility closed, some of the mentally challenged former patients found their way back to the woods of Willowbrook and took up residence in the tunnels and surrounding forest. It was there that a man named Andre Rand was introduced to the story. Born Frank Russian in March of 1944, Andre Rand began working as a custodian at the Willowbrook in 1960. It is unclear when or why Rand legally changed his name. Rand was known amongst the community as a quiet man who seemed to have a mild mental deficit himself. During his childhood and early adulthood, Rand's mother was in and out of psychiatric facilities in New York, and Rand was known to visit her often. Rand's documented crimes began around 1970, when he was arrested for picking up a group of 11 children from the local YMCA on a bus, offering them food and candy, and then driving them to Newark Liberty International Airport. To this day, no one knows what Rand's true intentions with the children were, but he was convicted of unlawful imprisonment of the children and served 10 months in jail. After Willowbrook was closed, Rand continued to live in and on the surrounding property, forming makeshift camps along with the other homeless of Staten Island. He should have also been charged with taking them to Newark, New Jersey, because <laughs> that place is a shithole. Well, nobody really knows. And I watched a documentary and the documentarian actually found one of these kids that had been on that bus. And he said, we didn't know any better. We were just little kids. And this guy rolls up on a bus. I, I have yet to find what kind of bus it was, where it came from. It didn't say that he stole this bus, so apparently he had access to it from somewhere. Maybe Willowbrook? Who knows? So he picks him up. He said that he just drove us around. We were having a good time. We thought we were going to get treats, and then all of a sudden we show up at the airport and all these cops are there. Well, this was also the time of innocence, too, when, you know, people, that was stranger danger wasn't like a super known thing and people just trusted everybody you know the, it, it, Staten Island was always a hotbed for the mob and all that criminal activity but you know it was that type of era where it just wasn't feasible to think when you walked down the street with you and your buddy you were going to get picked up by a stranger Rand fell off the radar but all the while Staten Island had fallen under the shadow of a wave of crimes in 1972 children began disappearing By 1987, five children had disappeared, four of whom had mental deficits. In 1975, five-year-old Alice Pereira disappeared while playing with her brother. In 1981, seven-year-old Holly Hughes vanished after going to the local corner store with a friend to get a bar of soap. 
In 1983, 11-year-old Tyhees Jackson disappeared after going to buy food at her mother's request. In 1984, 21-year-old Hank Gaforio disappeared. Although Hank was an adult, he suffered from a mental deficit that made his cognitive ability more like that of a young teenager. Finally, in 1987, Jennifer Schweiger, a 12-year-old girl with Down syndrome, disappeared. Upon Jennifer's disappearance, a massive search of Staten Island began, the islanders banding together in attempts to find the little girl. Parties combed the area close to where Jennifer was last seen, eventually ending up in the woods around Willowbrook Institution. On day 35 of the search, retired New York City firefighter George Kramer found what no one hoped to find, the remains of Jennifer Schweiger in a shallow grave in the woods surrounding Willowbrook. So this is where it gets to the point where this man is basically automatically a suspect, right? Because of where the proximity of where Jennifer's body was found. And this guy, you know, from all the stories that I've heard about Andre Rand, especially from, you know, my family, is that he was this homeless guy, you know, walking around. He was a weird dude. He was a weird dude before he was homeless. But uh, as you said before, a lot of these people had nowhere to go. So they started living vagrant lifestyle, started living in the homeless I started living like the homeless lifestyle. And if you know anything about the history in New York City, like uh, when Rudy Giuliani took over as mayor, Stat- or Stat- not only Staten Island, but New York City itself, like, got really clean. Like, it used to be that, you know, you see it in the old movies where it was dirty, it was disgusting. Like, and when Giuliani took over, like, you've seen a transformation in the city, and it became a lot cleaner. So the, a lot of this stuff was cut down on, but we're still in the 80s here, and... Uh, Staten Island wasn't as populated as it as it is now because you go there now and there's like you know every bit of land they're building something on like houses are so close together it's it's pretty insane but at the time that these crimes took place Staten Island was it's the smallest of the five boroughs and so it's the best too well at this time it was literally a landfill Oh, yeah, because Because the world's largest landfill is Fresh Kills, and it's on Staten Island. Right. So what the majority of Staten Island was at this point was literally a dump. And so that's why it made it so difficult to find any type of remains, any type of evidence. Literally, Jennifer Schweiger, and we'll touch. So at the time that these crimes happened, Staten Island was literally, the majority of it was a landfill. And that's why it made it so difficult to comb all of these areas. Yeah, they could go around Willowbrook. They could go in the, um, you know, the towns and the little areas where people lived. But there was so much dumping ground. I mean, it, it was just unreal. And so it didn't get, I hate to say, I don't think it got a lot of attention. And that's why the people of Staten Island came together so quickly to form, and again, I don't want to say it, but it was almost like vigilante justice. When you read through the history and when you look through the documentaries, and I'm sure that your dad could attest to this, these were people that just banded together because they didn't trust anybody else to do it on their own. Well, yeah, and that's how, you know, I I guess you don't know, because I don't know, but you are missing a child. You're missing a member of your community. And, uh, you want to be in control when you don't have control of a situation it's very frustrating it's very stressful it is like unnerving especially when it's your child that's out there missing and you don't know what to do and jennifer swiger was had was born with down syndrome so at that point too she's only 12 years old but doesn't have the mental capacity of a 12 year old and you're scared that just adds to the level of fright for you as a parent and you you know family members and everything else they don't see what what's being done the internal investigation so they don't know exactly what evidence they have what leads they have so they want yeah they want that control they want to be able to be like listen some those guys went home so let's let's keep searching you know we have our own search party let's let's band together let's keep looking and looking looking like i said i remember my dad combing through the woods kind of talking about you know as a kid listening to his story like he you know he was out there searching in the wilderness like there was so much woods in willowbrook staten island that you know it it was it was unoccupied land and 
there wasn't anything around. So if it was miles and miles of woods. And you're also looking at the pattern of the kind of the children that disappeared. Four out of five of these children did have men, a mental deficit of some type. And so they started finding that pattern of, yes, these kids are more trusting. You know, one of them was even an adult that had gone missing. And four of these five kids that we're talking about have never been seen again. No remains, nothing whatsoever. So as we get back into the story and the narrative, you're going to find out the depravity of these crimes and how shit got even more weird after the investigations kind of came to a standstill. They grew cold. Staten Islanders were devastated and eager to bring someone to justice for the heinous crime. Members of the community began coming forward, stating they had seen Jennifer Schweiger on the day she disappeared, talking to Andre Rand as he rode his bicycle. Additionally, investigators discovered a campsite where Rand had been staying just 150 yards from where Jennifer's body had been discovered. Now, other sightings of Rand with the other missing Staten Island children began to come out. Members of the community reported seeing Rand talking to Holly Ann Hughes on the day she disappeared from his VW Bug. It was also reported that Rand had been seen with Hank Gaforio at a local diner around the time of his disappearance. Oddly enough, Rand had also been questioned previously regarding the disappearance of Tyhees Jackson, but no charges were ever brought against him. For the local authorities, this was all the proof they needed to bring Andre in for questioning. In 1988, Rand was charged with the kidnapping and first-degree murder of Jennifer Schweiger. During the trial, multiple people from the community came forward and recounted their sightings of Rand with the missing children. However, there was zero forensic evidence linking Rand to any of these crimes. In fact, after concluding our research, it seems that there was no forensic evidence at all released to the public in regards to Jennifer's murder. As a result, the jury could not reach a verdict on the case of first-degree murder. They did, however, find Rand guilty of kidnapping Jennifer Schweiger, and Rand was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. So let's recount this. There was no physical proof that Rand committed these crimes. Now, this is going to get sensitive for anybody who is tied to this case or believes that the right man was captured. And this is just, you know, a narrative that I'm going to go into and just talk a little bit about because it seems like it happens quite often in the justice system. Now, neither Annie nor I are in law enforcement, neither Annie or I are any kind of criminal psychiatrist or psychologist or anything like that. We are just people who are intrigued by the mystery and the motive behind some of these people that commit these crimes. You've seen making a murder. You've seen things like that where Sometimes it seems that in order to solve a crime, solve a murder, it wants to be the cops and, you know, authorities want to wrap it up as quickly as possible. They want to find their man. They want to find justice for the victim. And sometimes the wrong person is convicted. Now, looking at the circumstantial evidence of Mr. Rand here, it's very odd that he was seen in the vicinity of all the people who were gone missing that to me in my mind would lead me to believe that he had some knowledge or something to do with the disappearance of these these people i'm going to stop you right there and i'm going to totally disagree why because after well doing... i wasn't finished with my opinion there but go ahead well you paused because like... i was trying to think of what i was going to say next yes but your pause makes it possible for me to kind of interject this clip here and say, I'm not saying they got the wrong guy. I'm saying Andre Rand could have totally been the criminal who, you know, committed these heinous crimes. But there was other shit going on in New York and the surrounding areas, actually in the United States in general at this time that I think put pressure on local law enforcement. And and that was what I was trying to say. Like, to bring it to, because well, you're talking about a time in the 1980s where one of the most renowned cases, not just in the United States in the world, but in the world was the, uh, the disappearance of this little boy named Eton Patz in New York City. This little boy was walking to school one day, I think on his own, disappeared and was never found again. Literally, they just convicted someone of his murder 
last year. There were other kids who went missing at the same time. You remember um, little Adam Walsh. Adam Walsh. Adam yes. Walsh disappeared around, you know, you're talking the 1980s when this stuff, like you talked about before, stranger danger was just coming to, uh, to, this is a time where people started to understand they couldn't just release their children out into society anymore and expect everybody to be kind to them. This was legitimately the time that they started putting pictures of missing children on milk cartons. Some of these kids that we're talking about today were some of the very first that were put onto milk cartons. And so these parents are all having a real come to Jesus moment with themselves about, the fact that they trusted their children in society and they can't do that anymore. Staten Island was such a small community. All these people band together to try to find Jennifer in hopes of finding her alive. And it didn't happen. And so they were pissed. And what they wanted to do was just, I don't want to say scapegoat, but Andre Rand became a very convenient person to point a finger at. There was zero forensic evidence. There was no DNA. There was no blood. And again, we're talking a time before DNA really came into play. But there was legitimately what I found in research, reading documentary or watching documentaries, reading all these different articles, nothing. But being somebody who's I'm, I'm not trying to say that they didn't get the right guy. I'm trying to say that a lot of times you hear cops talk a lot of times. They know who committed the crime. They know. You sit in a room with a guy or all these different kinds of criminals long enough, you can pick up all the traits of lying, of deceiving, of manipulation. You pick, you figure all that stuff out. It is the matter of tying all this together in evidentiary ways to bring it to court. And that's what I was saying. Like sometimes there's just, you know, there's that right scenario for that person to be at the right place at the right time to just be convicted of this crime. And I'm not saying at all that this guy's innocent because just the, the way he is, the mannerisms of how he is, I 100% think he had something to do with this. And whether he was responsible for all these disappearances or just the killing of Jennifer Swiger, but it's very odd that she was found close to where he was camped out and this guy had previously kidnapped kids before. I mean, it's not without a doubt that he had something obviously to do with this. It wasn't the only camp though. And so that brings into play something that we'll talk about, uh, you know, really briefly here, but possible accomplices to this, because you're looking at a man who himself seemed to have some type of a mental deficit. Yes, he had been convicted. Yes, he did take those other 11 children to the Newark airport for whatever reason you're talking about. Nobody really knows what the hell he was doing with those kids. But there's no physical evidence tying him to. He was guilty before proven innocent, in my opinion. Well, and I, I agree with that, too. That's what I was saying, that they, they find the man, the perfect scapegoat, and they roll with it. And you said the people were pissed. They were pissed. And Mr. Rand was the, was the guy that came down on the hardest. Let's take a break and then dive back into it. Oops. Spider build a symphony of bugs and weeds. You see the interconnectivity. Bugs, bass, sway 
Amidst the trees debris There's bug bits on everything Suspended perfectly By perfect weaves About as pristine as they tend to Temporary You watch it again to see what else you Hey, it's Brendan Shea and Annie Weebs. And if you like murder, legends, hauntings, and true crime, tune into Serial Spirits, the podcast every other Monday on Paranormal UK Radio Network. Serial Spirits, only on paukradio.com. Stay creepy, you kids. Now this is where the story turns weird again lending even more credence to the Staten Island boogeyman legend that tied back to Willowbrook Asylum. After Jennifer's murder, the Schweiger family began receiving anonymous letters in regards to the child's disappearance and who could have been involved. The letter stated that the area around Willowbrook was a haven not only for the homeless and possible former Willowbrook residents, but also for satanic cults. Townsfolk claimed to have visited the remnants of the asylum and surrounding woods and found evidence of cult activity. The letters claimed that all the missing children could have been abducted for the purpose of satanic sacrifice. The evidence they claim was tied to the cult, the process. Now this is the point of the story where I have to say, in the 80s, I think in the early 70s too, there was the whole satanic panic where all these people were scared that all these weird murders were taking place because of satanic rituals. Like people were listening to rock and roll music and like playing records backwards. They were playing, yeah, shit. they were playing their kiss records yeah, backwards and, was, and uh, shit got real weird. And shit got really weird. And it was at that point where, you know, every single murder got tied to have something to do with being satanic or something to do with that nature okay so do you think this was because things actually had ties to satanic cults and rituals or was this because media was playing up the shit that people were afraid of i think media was playing up the shit that people were afraid of because who else would you blame bad shit on but saint somebody who was a convicted serial killer had something to do with satanism so you know it, it could lead credence to that or it just could be the media's way of doing what they always do and inciting panic with the public. The process also had another famous member, serial killer David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam Killer. He claimed to be part of this cult. Berkowitz's murders also took place in New York during the 1970s. Was this just a bizarre coincidence linking the murders and two accused killers? Or was there a connection there? Almost as quickly as the letters had started arriving, the Schweiger family, they stopped, and the trail grew cold. The Staten Islanders who spent so much time searching for the missing girl went back to their daily lives and eventually stopped altogether, with the exception of a few residents who to this day continue to search the grounds of Willowbrook for evidence of missing children. It seemed that this case was never going to be solved. However, this changed again in 2004. Apparently, Andre Rand was growing bored in prison. He wrote letters, much like the one you heard at the beginning of the podcast, 
which by the way was creepy as shit. Creepy shit. He corresponded by mail to film producers and book publishers, would frequently set up meetings with them, and then refuse to talk with them to them when they arrived. Prison guards and inmates stated they heard Rand confess to claims of murder, including missing seven-year-old Holly Ann Hughes. He claimed that he was actually the one who gave her money to go to the corner store for soap on the day she disappeared. These stories did not fall on deaf ears. By this time, Holly Ann Hughes' older brother, Sean, was a detective in New York, and in the fall of 2004, Rand was accused of kidnapping the missing girl. The trial ended in October of that year, and Rand was convicted of the crime. He was sentenced to another consecutive 25 years to life in prison. Andre Rand will not be eligible for parole until 2037, when he will be 93 years old. There's a line in there that, you know, and this this narrative that we're reading from is like, it's not from anywhere else. This is what Annie wrote herself. This is all her own narrative. There's a line in there that says Rand was accused of giving Holly Ann Hughes money to go buy soap at the corner store. Now when I hear that line, I think that it's a possibility. I think it's a possibility that this was a ploy. He gave her money to go do something as gaining trust, grooming or something like that. And that's what I I, I, I wanna say that I think there's a bigger picture here. I think there's a bigger syndicate at large. I think Andre Rand may have been the fall guy. He may have been the guy that lured these children to trusting him to bring them somewhere for the purposes of whatever was going to happen to them next. Could have been a satanic cult? I don't know. Could have been something like Mambla that's around nowadays, the Man Boy Love Association. Was there a child ring, sex ring that had to do with Satanism? I don't know. It's just a theory that I, when I read that line, it just, it doesn't make sense that, why, why would that be in there? Why would he be like, he gave her money for soap? I don't know. And again, like you said, it's like they're trying to gain trust. And there was one more abduction and disappearance that I wanted to talk about before we kind of wrap things up. But it's still my feeling that Andre Rand was just the finger of a much larger hand that was at play here. There was one other noteworthy missing persons case during this time that didn't quite fit the M.O. of Rand, but didn't keep residents from pointing fingers at him. On October 24, 1978, 42-year-old Ethel Atwell disappeared from her workplace, the Willowbrook State School. Ethel, a physical therapist aide at the asylum, arrived for work that day at 6 a.m., Before she could get into the building, two other employees reportedly heard a man say, come on, come on, and then heard Ethel say, no, you'll beat me, followed by a female scream. The employees called police, and once they arrived, they found Ethel's purse, one earring, a black shoe, three coat buttons, and half of Ethel's set of dentures scattered throughout the parking lot. Her car keys were found in the woods about 45 feet away. An extensive search of the area commenced, but nothing was found. Ethel Atwell was never seen again. I can uh, add a little bit of insight to this as far as like our listeners are concerned and as far as you're concerned. This uh, Willowbrook uh, was a stop on... Willowbrook is a little suburb of Staten Island, okay? Where Willowbrook State Hospital sits, they call it Willowbrook because that's where it's at. It's in Willowbrook, Staten Island. And uh, where the asylum sat, it was actually a bus stop. So there was a bus stop that would stop there and pick up people who were either working there or worked around the area, right? So... Uh, a bus would come and would loop the whole property and come around and pick people up. And the only reason I know this is because when I was living in Staten Island, I didn't take the bus. I was a little kid. You know what I mean? If we got on the bus or whatever, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was a kid, you know? So the only reason I know this is because my aunt Gina, as I said before, she used to work there and she would take that bus. She said she had to get up at five in the morning, whatever, get there super early just so she could be there on time. And because it was across the island from where she lived. But my dad, my dad would take that bus too. And he said it always creeped him out riding up on that bus because, you know, he knew the depravity and he knew like weird things happened and the people who were, you know, associated with that building being as like that was the the concept back then. And he was always creeped out, but it, it it was a bus stop. So it would make sense that there would be somebody 
getting on. Maybe this had nothing to do with Rand or anything like that, but it would be it would make sense that there would be a crime scene there just because it was it was a public there was foot traffic. You know, there was foot traffic in and out of that place all the time. Well, it also makes sense that if there were multiple people involved in the crimes at hand, it would have been a really convenient way for them to leave and come into the crime scene. So think about it. If you're coming in there to uh, to commit some type of crime, number one, you're coming into a heavily forested area that at that time was not populated. It was kind of surrounded by the three hospitals that were kind of in like a half moon shape almost. There's a bus stop in there. So that would have been easy access in and out of the area. So if you were going to commit a crime, you could have come in there got off the bus, did whatever you wanted to do, and get back on the bus and get the hell out of Dodge if that was your MO. It was the perfect, it makes it the perfect place and the perfect situation for somebody who wanted to come in and out of there really quickly. And like you said, your dad was one of these people who had to come in and out of there for work. He didn't like stopping there. I guarantee the other people who got off at that bus stop didn't want to be sitting there either. And I hate to say it probably would have turned a blind eye to weird shit that was going on there because of the place that you're in. You don't want to think about being outside of one of the most highly renowned psychological hospitals in the United States when it had just been on the news for something as terrible as as what it had been portrayed in Geraldo's expose that he did. And that's exactly it. You know, (laughs) I laugh at this because it's actually funny. New York City has been known for years for being a hotbed for assholes. You know what I mean? Like, you walk down the street and, like, you ask somebody for directions. They look the other way. They want nothing. Hey, I'm walking here. You know, the kind of thing. (laughs) Over there, over here. Over there. But, like, you know, that's exactly what it was like. Like, you just turned a blind eye because you see some guy, and it's sad to say. But you do. I, I've been there. I've done it myself. I'm guilty of it. You walk down the streets of Manhattan. There's some guy walking down the street, like, just saying all this weird shit. And you just kind of, like, look the other way. Like, uh, don't even acknowledge him. Like, you see him, but you just keep walking. Like, you just mind your own business. And people did that all the time. Like, that's what New York is synonymous for, for being an asshole. It wouldn't surprise me that if something like this happened, like, and people were just like, oh, they're getting into a fight. It's a domestic dispute you know what i mean and then it escalated as it got out of the public view which would make sense too because if you're abusing somebody you know and you're this fucking guy who's wants to keep a good reputation going on if you're gonna beat your girl or whatever you take her out of sight of other people then you tell her what's going on you know what i mean no i'm I'm, I'm, I'm being serious like you sound like this is something you've experienced no no you want to beat your girl you just take her over in the alley and you just beat the shit out of her and she's never gonna say anything else i'm not that guy but it's just it would make sense that, that 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 would go on and people would turn a blind eye. Plus, they know what's going on here. Like, oh, this woman might be just screaming because she's from the hospital. She's a mental patient who got out and somebody's coming to get her. And that could be a good ploy for somebody to use, too. Like, here's this woman. Like, oh, he can turn to the people and just be like, oh, I'm sorry. She just somebody who, is, you know, she was a patient here. She got out. We got to get her back in the building. The screams could have legitimately fallen on deaf ears. Exactly. At that time. Exactly. And so it just... It makes it an easy target for the type of crimes that they were committing at this point. And you want to talk about a time in a society when things were changing. So the 1980s were this kind of turning point in missing children's cases. When you're talking about one of the most famous cases of, uh, of missing children in United States history, Eton Pats, who disappeared in New York City when he was like walking to school during this same time era. Um, these other children, uh, we talked a little bit um, before about uh, Adam Walsh, you know, the son of John Walsh, who was the uh, the host of America's Most Wanted. These kids. That was my mom's favorite show of all time. Too. Was it really? Yeah. You, See, crime stuff runs in the family. But you've also heard me talk about the story that or the. Well, yeah, I guess the story that 
I, the house that I live in has a tie to Adam Walsh and the disappearance. Yeah, disappearance. it does. And that's that's something else we should cover, too. That's like, another it, weird it one. Shay and I have this... I don't know how it's happened. We have the love of true crime in our hearts, but then we've also learned in our adult years, of, as things have proceeded, I bought a house that actually had a tie to Adam Walsh and the disappearance of Adam Walsh. It's It's neither here nor there in this story, but so um, we're talking about a, a, a time period when it was no longer safe to let your children out into society unsupervised. Some of these children that we're talking about today were the very first children who were put on milk cartons, you know, as missing kids. So this is a time when society is changing. Parents learn that it's no longer safe to let your kids go play in the neighborhood unsupervised. Like you talked about the satanic panic and all this crazy shit that was going on in an area. Staten Island was also known, I hate to say it, but kind of like the dumping ground of the five boroughs. So Staten Island is the smallest of the five boroughs. It was set apart because of its Um, you know, being across the river. And so at that time, a large part of Staten Island was just a landfill for the other five boroughs. And so that's why this kind of small community felt like it was necessary to come together because maybe they felt like they didn't have anybody else to stand up for them. They were kind of the outcasts. They were literally living on this island that had become known for Just being a landfill for garbage. And I hate to say it, but kind of like a landfill for people, too. Because you've got the three hospitals there that were in the Green Belt, which was this, you know, heavily wooded area. One that used to be a an army facility, which, you know, if you've ever been to any type of VA institution they're I hate to say it, but they're not typically... um, really ranked high in the upper echelon of the hospital community as far as their care for their patients. There was a tuberculosis hospital, and then there was the asylum. So you kind of had the outcasts of society out there amongst these landfills. So kind of in wrapping up all of this conversation that we've had about, number one, Willowbrook, Number two, Andre Rand and the crimes that he was accused of. And number three, these people who are still missing. What's your theory about the crimes that we talked about today and Andre Rand and his involvement of these missing persons cases? What I have to say first is like, as in wrapping this up, like this is where urban legends get started you know we kind of talked about that the cropsy the cropsy urban legend started from truth from somewhere as a lot of legends do they a, start they from, start from the truth they start from some type of truth and just get misconstrued and it's just like the, the telephone game you know somebody says hey annie's uh got her ear pierced then by the 10th phone call it's like did you hear annie got her her nipples pierced <laughs> That, that by the tenth, and they're call. all infected. Yeah, they're all infected. But that's how it starts. It starts somewhere. There's, it's rumor. It's rumor based, right? But it, there's some truth to the bottom of this, and this makes sense. That this is where the Cropsey legend came from, because there's some truth somewhere. There were bodies found, people were kidnapped, people were missing. You know, it started somewhere. So my theory in this story really corresponds with yours, Shay. I think there's an absolute possibility that Andre Rand could have had something to do with these missing children. I do not think he acted alone. I think there were multiple people involved in the story. And like you said before, maybe he was just the fall guy. Maybe he was the person that because of proximity and ease of access, the police decided to focus on him. The police wanted this to be over. The police didn't want a bad rap for any type of a faulty investigation. They wanted the families of Staten Island to feel safe, and so they wanted to wrap this up as soon as possible. Well, thank you guys for listening to another episode of Serial Spirits, the podcast. Got any final thoughts, Weebs? I 
right. Bye, guys. Thank you, guys. We'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for listening to another episode of Serial Spirits, the podcast. As always, your hosts were Brendan Shea and Annie Weibel, a.k.a. The Weebs. All music on this episode was composed by Annie Weibel for Serial Spirits. The song at break was Bug Bits by the one and only Evan Parker. Tune in every other Monday to Serial Spirits, the podcast on www.paukradio.com. That's Paranormal UK Radio Network.